Um, take your Bibles, if you will, open them up to the book of Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. This is actually, uh, as we're going through these parables, this is actually a uh, parable that I have never preached from before and never did this kind of an in-depth study on before. And so it's been uh, very interesting to me. Uh, but uh, Matthew chapter 9, we're going to be uh, looking at verses 14 through 17. Uh, and the verses that lead up to this parable that Jesus gives, we find Jesus in Capernaum where he meets a tax collector by the name of Matthew who who, is, uh, who became a follower of Jesus, uh, an apostle of Jesus, and uh, he is even the author of this specific gospel, the gospel of Matthew. When Jesus meets Matthew, he instructs him to follow me, uh, and Matthew immediately does so. In the Gospel of Luke, we see Matthew made a great feast and uh, kind of threw a party uh, to celebrate. And uh, he invited uh, all that he knew to join him in celebration and his uh, decision to follow after Christ. Uh, the guest list included publicans, sinners, scribes, Pharisees, uh, other of Christ's disciples, and Christ himself. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, as they look around and see what's going on as Jesus is there, uh, like I said, and, and the publicans and sinners are there, uh, the Pharisees begin to belittle the disciples of Christ uh, by uh, giving them prideful remarks concerning the fact that they were eating and drinking with publicans and sinners, and not just them, but their master, Jesus himself, was eating and drinking with publicans and sinners. This is the lowest of the low in their society at that time. How despicable and embarrassing it would have been. And that's, that's what the Pharisees are, are drawing their attention to. But that's when Jesus himself steps in and gives a powerful statement uh, to kind of shut their mouths concerning uh, their belittling of not only Jesus, but the other disciples and the publicans and sinners. Mark chapter 2 verse 17 and when Jesus heard it he said to them they that are whole have no need of a physician but they that are sick I came not to call the righteous but the sinner to repentance this is when we get uh, the parable and the reason uh, that Jesus speaks this parable in the first place so Matthew chapter 9 starting in verse 14 then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but the disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast." No man putting a piece of new cloth onto an old garment for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment and the, uh, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine in old bottles. Either the bottles break about the wine uh, running, runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. We see uh, the, the concept that Jesus, and remember, uh, Jesus is using these parables to, uh, to try to get a point across, to get them to better understand his point. So the concept that Jesus is trying to get them to understand is relayed in three different ways here uh, in Matthew chapter uh, 9, verses 14 through 17. Uh, so we're going to look at those three, uh, but we're going to start by looking uh, at the, uh, verse number 14. Uh, then they, uh, or then came uh, to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but the disciples fast not? So uh, as we're looking at this, as we're looking at this uh, section of parables and, and trying to figure out what it is that Jesus is trying to teach them, uh, we see that he uses uh, three different illustrations or three different metaphors to try to get his point across. He is going to, uh, to go from one thought to the next and one leads to the next. And by the time he gets to the end, uh, he, he's taught them uh, three different principles. Uh, and so uh, he, he's trying to get them to understand uh, that, that 
that uh, based on their uh, religious beliefs and the religious teaching, based on uh, the, the Pharisees and scribes, the Jewish leaders of the day, and uh, the fact that, uh, that the gospel is going to be made known to everybody and available to everybody. And uh, he, he's talking about uh, uh, there are times in life when, when it's best to, uh, to do away with the old and embrace the new. So out with the old and in with the new. And the first thing we see uh, him talking about when the, uh, when the disciples of John come uh, or came to him was out with the old patterns uh, uh, and in with the, the new concepts. The, the disciples of John were literally those that were followers of John the Baptist. Now they knew him and believed him to be the forerunner for the Messiah. And because John recognized Jesus as, uh, as being the Messiah, they, uh, they, they, they put their trust in that same uh, thing. So these, uh, these disciples of John, having been uh, groomed under John and taught under John, and uh, if you remember, John the Baptist was a very devout man, a very uh, religious man, if you will, and uh, he, was, uh, he was given to, uh, to uh, the, uh, his beliefs 100%, and so uh, these men saw that and believed in those things. This is the disciples of John. Uh, they come to Jesus, and uh, we see the discourse uh, with Jesus. They, uh, they pose this statement, which is also a question. They said, look, why is it that we fast all the time and the, the Pharisees fast all the time, but, but we don't see your followers fasting? They're, as he's asking this question to Jesus, it's not a, uh, it's not a uh, disrespectful thing. They, they, it's a legitimate question. They want to know why. Uh, and we can see uh, as far as the, uh, well, we'll look at that in a few moments, but he said, we fast Often the, the uh, they fast the Pharisees fasting twice a week and uh, and even going through other times throughout the year of uh, ritualistic fasting. Uh, he says we're doing all this fasting, but but as we look at your followers, as we look at your disciples, they're making these big feasts and inviting everybody over and celebrating. Why is what's the difference? Why is it that they're not as as concerned, if you will, as we are? The implication, as they're asking Jesus this, uh, this question, uh, the, as they're, uh, the implication as they're, as they're questioning Jesus this is, uh, is fasting regarded by you or your followers at all? Is fasting become pointless uh, and something that, that you don't teach and that you don't uh, lead others to do? Or maybe is it that your followers are neglecting to follow through with this? And so in ways they're kind of questioning the devotion of, uh, of the followers followers of Jesus. So this is an opportunity. Jesus is going to answer the question directly, uh, but also take the opportunity to further their understanding as far as who Jesus is and uh, what, how they are to, to respond and live based on him being that Messiah. Jesus taught his disciples that fasting was important. After the healing of the demon-possessed boy in Mark chapter number 9, the disciples asked Jesus why they themselves weren't successful in doing the same thing as far as healing the demon-possessed boy. Uh, we see in Mark 9 verse 28, this is how uh, this unfolds. And when they came uh, into the house, his disciples asked him privately, privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind cometh forth not, or cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So the, the reason, uh, one of the reasons that, the, that you were unsuccessful, and he talks about it, them having little faith, he says, but look, there are some things in life, some movings of Almighty God, and some things that, uh, that work the miraculous that only come as a result of prayer and fasting. And so he taught his disciples that that was, uh, that that was a uh, needful thing in each individual follower life. Jesus also exemplified in the wilderness when he prayed and fasted uh, 40 days and 40 nights before he started his earthly ministry. We see that in, uh, in Matthew. Jesus recognized that there was an issue with these men that needed to be addressed. Why is it we fast and why is it the Pharisees fast? 
but you and your followers aren't fasting. These men seemed to be trying to fit Jesus and his teaching into their lives instead of fitting their lives into Jesus and his teaching. Does that make sense? They were trying to, uh, they had this idea of who and what Jesus was, and they were trying to fit him into their life, this preconceived notion, preconceived ideas, instead of them recognizing Jesus for who he was and doing what they can to fit into the, uh, to his teaching and his requirements in their life. So Jesus uses this opportunity. Uh, it goes from that, and he gives these three analogies, and then as you look at the whole of this uh, parable, uh, we see that they make, uh, there are some discoveries for uh, the Christian journey, the discoveries for uh, the disciples of John uh, for, uh, for their life. These discoveries will be made obvious through the three metaphors Jesus will use to address the question posed by the disciples of John. And they will learn two important lessons. When it comes to Jesus, he changes everything. The, the idea and the, uh, his teaching and who and what he is, his, his ministry, everything about Jesus, when he enters into the picture, he changes everything. And number two... We see the, the idea uh, being revealed, and we'll look at it here in a second, all throughout the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is better than anything. Jesus is better than everything. Jesus uh, is the key to, uh, to absolutely everything. And so uh, here is what Jesus him, himself said concerning, uh, concerning these things. Uh, he said, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 17 and 18, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, he changes everything, and he's better than anything, uh, but he says, don't think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He is the answer. He, he, changes, he changes everything because he is the fulfillment of the law uh, and the teaching of the prophets. For verily I say unto you, uh, till heaven and earth pass, one jot and one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And so uh, that's, uh, that's the first part of this as... As we see uh, Jesus telling them to out with the old pattern, the way of thinking, and in with the new concepts that he teaches both through his life and through his legacy, through his ministry, uh, and as we, uh, we looked at this last weekend through his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, the second thing uh, is, is really the first metaphor that he uses. Uh, he talks in verse uh, 15 and paints a picture of... Uh, out with the old ways of the priests and in with the new communion. What is it I'm talking about? He said, uh, can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the day will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then shall they feast. He uses this metaphor uh, uh, trying to get them to understand uh, the time and the, uh, what it was that they were doing and uh, what it was that, that Matthew and the rest of those were doing as, as Jesus and the publicans and sinners as they had come together for the purpose of uh, celebrating with, with Matthew. We see Jesus addressing uh, through this question of fasting the reason uh, that he talks about there are some that have a reason to fast. The bridegroom uh, or the, the children of the bridegroom is literally a picture uh, of, the, uh, of the bridegroom's uh, friends, those that care the most about them and do what they can uh, to take care of and to help provide for and uh, to lead him in different ways. And so uh, can, can the friend of a bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is there? As long as your friend is with you, can you mourn their absence? Is, is, it, is it timely? Does it make any sense? Uh, uh, I remember uh, just the, the this last visit that I made, spending all that time with my friends and, and family members and getting to see my mom, I hadn't seen her in a while, and uh, I remember, uh, you know, asking my mom, she was looking a little bit down, and I said, what in the world, why, why do you look so down? She said, well, we only got one more day with you guys. 
And I said, well, it doesn't do us any good to, uh, to get down in the mully grubs about it now while I'm here. We're wasting time. Well, we could be having a good time, and, and yet we're focusing on the negative. And that's literally what Jesus is talking about. Does it make any sense, or uh, is it timely, or uh, is there any purpose or, or a, a positive way of spinning the idea of, uh, of the bridegroom's friends mourning while the bridegroom is still with them? Does it make any sense at all? And the answer is obviously no. He says, look, while, uh, while he is with them, it makes only good sense for them to rejoice together because there's coming a day when that bridegroom will be removed. And when that happens, there will be a cause for mourning. And obviously, Jesus is making reference to, uh, as, as all of those were together, Matthew, the publicans, the sinners, the other, uh, the, the other disciples that were following after him. He says, look, while I am still here, they have a reason to rejoice. While the Messiah is with them, they have a reason to, uh, to celebrate. The reason as far as the... Uh, the uh, disciples of John the Baptist, they, they had a reason to fast. And here, here are the reasons for their fasting. Their teaching and their looking forward to and their hope for the coming Messiah. So they would fast uh, for the coming Messiah, his ministry to be successful and, and uh, for folks to hear and to respond to the preaching of the message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were hoping for the power of God to show up uh, because when the Messiah would come, he would offer all hope. They were uh, praying for personal strength. God, give me the strength to, uh, to endure. God, give me the strength to live this dedicated uh, consecrated, separated life for you. Uh, give us power as we're preaching this message. So there was, there was definitely reason for the disciples of John the Baptist to fast. There was also reason for the Pharisees to fast. Their reasons were a little bit different. As you see through the teaching of Jesus, and even as we've just, uh, uh, we're in Matthew 9, just a couple of chapters before, as Jesus is, is preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, and he starts talking about fasting, he says, look, don't be like the Pharisees who walk around with their face all contorted and uh, looking miserable uh, and drawing attention to the fact that they've, uh, that they've uh, sacrificed a meal for the purpose of, uh, quote unquote, getting a hold of God. Don't, don't be like them. Him, but when you fast, do it, uh, do it with sincerity. The Pharisees fasted for show. The Pharisees fasted for self-righteousness, self-righteous purposes, so that others could see, so that others would think of themselves as something, and even so that they themselves could say, look at what I have done. The Pharisees would also fast for the purpose of sacrament or, or uh, uh, religious beliefs or uh, just because it was what was expected and what they had always been taught. It was a ceremony kind of thing. So the disciples of John had a reason to fast. The disciples or the, the Pharisees had a reason to fast. But the followers of Jesus had a reason to feast. We see in these verses the appropriateness as far as uh, the bridegroom is with them. It's not a time for them to mourn. It's not a time for them to be sad. It's a time for them to, uh, to rejoice, to be excited about things. But, but as we look at all of this, it's also uh, another reason to, uh, to feast is, is because of, of who and what Jesus is. What it was, was that he was, uh, he was starting there with his earthly ministry, uh, what it was that he promised, what it was that was uh, going to come as a result of him uh, living and dying and coming again, the hope of heaven. That is a reason to feast. And so uh, they are celebrating the fact that the Messiah is with them at that moment. So uh, out with the old uh, priests uh, that uh, if you wanted to have a, uh, uh, your request be made known to God or if you wanted to hear from God in the Old Testament, they would, they would come and they would, uh, they would uh, seek out the priest and they would give them the message and they would say, take that message and bring back the message from God. And, and by the way, that's, that's how 
God ordained it, and that's how God laid it out in the Old Testament. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but again, Jesus changes everything, and Jesus is better than anything else. And so because, uh, because uh, Jesus was there and with them, they didn't have to go to the, uh, uh, by the way of the priest. They had the opportunity of communion with God because Jesus is God. Jesus is God in the flesh. So, uh, so literally, uh, he is saying Jesus isn't a substitute for God. He is God. There's no need uh, uh, for the followers of Jesus to fast for, uh, for the coming Messiah because he's there for personal strength because they can ask him personally uh, for uh, power in their preaching because he is right there. They can ask for him for those things right there. Jesus isn't a substitute for God. He is God with us. That's what we see in verse 15. So why, don't they, why aren't they praying and fasting as the Pharisees and the disciples of John the Baptist? Because the Messiah is right there with them. God is right there with them. And that leads us to the, uh, to the second uh, metaphor. No man putteth a, uh, a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. This metaphor gives the idea of out with the old ways of practices, procedures, and in with the new covenant. Those ritualistic practices that he's referring to. Uh, now there was there were times and there were there were seasons and there was uh, moments in, in the teaching of the Pharisees and of the children of Israel, the Jewish people. Uh, there were days that were set aside and there were times that were set aside for the purpose of fasting, getting a hold of God and, and uh, having the God move upon you and move amongst your people. There was definitely uh, reasons for that, but they had become ritualistic practices. Uh, those things were set up. Uh, Exodus chapter 24, you remember when we did our study through the book of Exodus that God had revealed to him his will, his desire concerning uh, sacrifice, concerning what they were to give to God. Uh, and as uh, God made all of those things to Moses and then Moses made all those things known to the people in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 7, it says, and he took the book of the covenant and read uh, in the audience of the people and they said, all that the Lord hath said we will do. And will be obedient concerning the sacrifices and the offering. Verse 8, Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made uh, with uh, you concerning all these words. Again, there's nothing wrong with what God told them to do. There's nothing wrong with them making these sacrifices and going through with this, uh, this schedule that was laid out for them by Almighty God. But Jesus is better. He is that ultimate sacrifice. He is that one uh, final sacrifice for all of humanity. The sacrifice is annually. That was a ritualistic practice. Part of the ritualistic practice that I already talked about is them having to, uh, to go to the priest. The priest would go into the Holy of Holies uh, and he would have to cleanse himself and, uh, before he could go in. And it was such a sacred place that he, uh, they would tie a rope on his ankle and they would put bells on him. And if they stopped hearing the bells ring, they would tug on it to see uh, if he was okay, if he had passed out or if he died. They realized it was such a holy uh, place that they, that they weren't allowed to go into so that if the priest died in the Holy of of holies, they would pull them out by the rope. That's, that's, that's pretty funny to me, right? Uh, but uh, here's, the, here's the idea. They would make these sacrifices as a ritualistic pa practice, uh, but they also had a secondhand relationship with, with, with God as far as uh, them hearing from. Uh, they would speak through that mediator and uh, them uh, making their request made known unto God. So it was secondhand access to God. It was uh, sacrificing annually. These were ritualistic practices, but also uh, the, the way of sanctification and what uh, the people saw as, as their responsibility, not because God didn't make things clear, but because even the high priest, even those religious leaders would, would twist things. 
for their own gain and their own pro, uh, uh, prosperity and their own pride. And so they would twist things. So uh, sanctification on, on the part of an individual was a little bit am ambiguous because of the compromise of spiritual leaders. How do I make myself worthy of God? Uh, how do I make myself worthy of his hand of blessing? How uh, do I keep myself from experiencing the wrath of God? All those things were part of ritualistic practice. But we see that there is a real problem. The law that they were holding to, these practices of sacrifice and uh, all that goes with it, all of that, God gave us a law. He gave us all those things to help us realize that our very best efforts just aren't good enough. We can't be pleasing to God on our own. We can't have, uh, we can't have a worthy sacrifice. We can't have access to, to God because we are undeserving and unworthy in every way. The real problem, Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Isaiah chapter 64, verse, uh, uh, verse 6, but we are all as unclean things and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know what the biggest problem with uh, the ritualistic practices and uh, the old ways of following through with these ordinances and these practices, the real problem is that the very best that we can do still falls short. And yet the Pharisees uh, were trying to continue to do that. They were uh, trying to prove their worth and their value before God. And uh, they were trying to prove their, uh, their, their seat or their place in heaven was absolutely secure by the light that they were living. Ritualistic practices carries with it a real big problem. Our very best falls short. I want to read a handful of verses they give us an understanding of the remedy for this. If we're going to be out with the old ways and practices and in with the new covenant, the remedy for the, uh, that's been provided is obviously that new covenant. No man putting a piece of, of new cloth into an old garment. He says, look, uh, you can't take what is old and wore out and put a brand new uh, piece of garment and sew it in there and expect it not to show, uh, show even more wear. He said the reality is the, uh, the new piece of garment, it, it's not broke in, it's not as soft, and so it causes the tear to get even worse. Not only that, it looks horrible. You ever put something brand new in, uh, in an area that's all old and wore out? We, we got a brand new piece of furniture on the front of our porch and I realized we're about 10 years past due on redoing our front porch. Amen. Uh, we, we had our whole, we painted the whole interior of our house except for the doors. And we realized very quick that our doors are, are yellow because the people who lived in us before, they smoked. And so it, it, show, it showed all the, uh, all the faults. They were just uh, hitting you right in the face. That's what it's talking about, uh, th this garment. You don't want to put that new piece of cloth on something that's old and wore out. Not only does it not look right, but it's going to cause the older garment to, uh, to wear out even more or the rent be made worse. So what's the remedy? Out with the old and in with the new. Out with the old way of practices, trying to do right, that old wore out way of religion and the, and the adoption of the new covenant. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament. That word testament translates into covenant. This is, for this is my blood of the New Covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sin. The new covenant found in Jesus, who laid down his life, who shed his blood, who, whose body was broken uh, so, that, uh, so that we could experience remission of sin. That's a whole lot better than any sacrifice of a lamb for one year. Amen? 
Hebrews chapter 6, uh, or chapter 8, uh, starting in verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. The old covenant, the old promise that comes with it is, you'd make this sacrifice, you're good for a year. The new covenant with new promise says, if you trust, if you will believe and trust in the sacrifice that's already been made, you're good until forever. I mean, that, that's kind of a good warranty, right? Verse 7 of chapter 8, For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he saith, uh, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in, uh, in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. He said, Look, I made this covenant with their fathers, and yet they didn't follow through with it. I did my part, but they didn't do their part. And that, that reality continued and persisted up until Jesus giving this, uh, uh, giving this parable. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their mind and write them on their heart. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. Skipping to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ, being made an high priest uh, of good things to come, be a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not to say, uh, not, of this uh, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in, in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and uh, the ashes of heifers sprinkled, uh, sprinkling of the unclean was sufficient to purify uh, for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through eternal, uh, eternal uh, spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead, uh, works uh, to serve uh, the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament or the mediator of the new covenant, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressor, uh, transgressors uh, that were under the first testament or first covenant, they which are called might receive promise of eternal inheritance. All of that is to say this, as he's talking in Hebrews, uh, most believe that it's, it, it's Paul, not everybody does, uh, but as the author of the book of Hebrews is going through this and saying that Jesus is better, that Jesus changes everything, he says, look, when we were under the old law, when, uh, when, when our parents were under the old law, uh, God did everything necessary for, for them to be successful, and yet they turned their back and did their own thing. And it's been the same case from that time until now. But Jesus offers a new covenant. That covenant says that you don't have to make a sacrifice every year so that you could uh, be covered, that you don't have to, uh, to go to the priest uh, to, uh, to have a communication and fellowship with God. You don't have to, uh, to wonder whether or not you are right in the eyes of God. You can go to him on your own. You can, uh, you can experience the, uh, that, that new covenant with wa which redeems you and washes you clean and makes you worthy of the presence of God. It's not taking a new patch and putting it on an old wore out garment. It's becoming that new creature that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. That new covenant, that new offer. Jesus, uh, according to uh, verse 16, Jesus isn't a patch to complete our righteousness. We don't take what the Old Testament requires and try to fit Jesus into that. No, Jesus is that new covenant. He's not a patch to complete my righteousness. He is my righteousness. The fourth and final thing, verse 17. He's talking about uh, neither uh, do men put new wine in old bottles, uh, uh, else the bottle break and the wine run out and the bottles perish, but uh, they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. Uh, 
It's a little confusing as it uses the word bottles. It's literally speaking of uh, the animal skins that were used to transport uh, to transport uh, the wine or the uh, the juice of the vine. Uh, and he says, you don't want to take an old wore out animal skin that's been carrying and that that uh, that has had multiple uses and uh, has been stretched. And and by the way, the uh the, the animal skins that they would use, it wasn't like the small ones that, that we see uh, on TV sometimes, the little personal ones. It's talking about the, the big ones that would hold up to 60 gallons a piece, and they would, they would tie the ends of them together, and they would lay them across the back of a camel or a mule or something like that. And, and you can imagine uh, 60 gallons of weight inside that animal skin causing it to stretch. Over time, you don't want to continue to put something valuable in that because it's going to end up breaking, Right? That's what it's talking about. And uh, you, you also don't want to uh, make it unbalanced as far as a, a new and an old skin. An old skin, because it's stretched, it'll hold more. And a new skin uh, won't hold quite as much. And it'd be unbalanced and it could fall and burst. And uh, here's what he's talking about. Here's the idea, the picture that he's trying to paint. Out with the old and in with the new. Out with the old ways of trying to prove our worth. Remember, he's talking about those who, why is it that we, have, we fast all the time, we do all of these things, and yet your people are just having a good time? He says, look, uh, because the bridegroom's still around, there's a reason to rejoice. It doesn't make any sense for them to, uh, to, to mourn when the bridegroom is still there. And with that in mind, you wouldn't take uh, you wouldn't take an old garment, an old wore out uh, garment, and put a brand new patch on it because it's going to cause more harm. He says uh, you do away with the garment and you and you uh, you take that new uh, that new whole garment and and uh, you wear that and and you don't take an old uh, wine skin and and fill it with brand new wine. It's going to cause you all kinds of problems. This way of thinking, this, this uh, uh, metaphor that Jesus is using, he's talking about the old ways of trying to prove one's worth and being that new creature that Jesus in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 promises that we will be. Pure religion is empty, according to Jesus. It looks good on the outside, but it looks a whole lot different on the inside. Jesus in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28, and really all of Matthew chapter 23 is addressing the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you look uh, like uh, whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful on the outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. When what's on the inside is what it's supposed to be, it'll show itself on the outside. But when all we do is take care of what's on the outside and on the inside, we're still dead. We're hypocrites. And that's what the Pharisees were guilty of. They kept trying to prove their worth and their value, trying to prove their own righteousness. That old way of thinking. And Jesus says, I haven't come so that you can continue to try to prove, but so that you could be made a new creature. Pure religion is empty, but a personal relationship, it's eternal. It starts by faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So this personal relationship, it starts with faith. It's followed up with works. Because he made me a new creature, I live like that new creature. James chapter 2, starting in verse uh, 14. 
What does it profit, my brother, though a man say that he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? That's an interesting question. He goes on to say, If a brother or sister be naked of destitute of daily food, and one say unto them, Depart in peace, and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not the things which are needful for the body, does it profit them in any way? Verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say that thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, O vain man, or but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. This personal relationship he's talking about, it, it starts with, a, with faith, but it's followed up with works. And this personal relationship is, is kept through communication. He opens a line for us of prayer. He gives us his word and the Holy Spirit to help us in devotion. He gives us opportunity of service. He provides for us a place of worship. Uh, he gives us a reason to praise He says, don't put that new wine, that relationship that, uh, with God, don't put that in the old, wore-out skin. It's not going to hold up. But you take it and you put it in a new skin. As, uh, don't, don't accept the, uh, the idea that you have to continually prove uh, who you are and you have to continually do all these things as the Pharisees are doing. They're dead on the inside. But if you will take that new life, that, uh, that new drive, and you will place it in that new skin, and you will live out that life as a child of God, you'll be successful. You have the hope of eternal life. So when it comes to putting the wine in the old bottle or the new bottle, he's talking about out with the old way of proof and in with the new creation. Jesus isn't an addition to fix a tired, old, wore-out religion, which is what the Pharisees were living based on, right? Again, not that, not that the, the foundations of it were wrong because it was instituted of God. But when Jesus comes to the picture, he changes everything, and he's better. It's more, uh, it has nothing to do anymore with, with religious practices as much as it does with a relationship with God. Jesus isn't an additive to fix a tired, old, wore out religion. He is the access to a relationship with God. Jesus isn't a patch uh, to complete my righteousness. He alone is my righteousness. Jesus isn't a substitute for God. He is God with us. So why don't they fast like we do? Because God's with them. All they have to do is ask. Why is it that they don't fast like we do? Why is it that they don't seem as religious as we are? Because they've experienced that new relationship, that new covenant that, uh, that offers them salvation, not just for this year, but for eternity. You don't want to put a, a brand new patch on an old wore out garment. They're celebrating because they've been set free. Why is it that they don't seem as devoted and uh, that they're not serving it maybe as much as we are? Because you don't put a new wine in an old skin. Jesus isn't there to fix an old wore out tired religion. The religious crowd they have their glory. The religious crowd, they get what they're looking for. Fame, fortune, notoriety. But the folks who have a relationship, the folks who have a, uh, a uh, deep-seated relationship, a, a communion with God, those that, that are able to walk and talk with God, those that, uh, uh, that approach Him through, uh, through uh, grace and prayer, they have a reason to rejoice. I, I've said it over and over and over and over again. The Christian life is designed to be enjoyed. And I believe that's what Jesus is teaching here. 
There's a time for fasting and prayer. Jesus taught that and he exemplified that. Obviously, we're to live righteously, we're to serve, we're to, uh, to, to live that separated, consecrated life, that we are to be uh, devoted to, to the cause of Christ, we are to, uh, to live uh, based on the, uh, the leading and the teaching of scriptures. None of those things have changed. It's just that Jesus is better. Jesus, none, none of those things are done away with, but they have all been changed because Jesus has fulfilled every one of them. So why is it they're rejoicing instead of fasting and praying? Because what they're looking for is right here with them. What's exciting about this to me is that we have a promise from God that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And so as we go through this life, there will be moments and there will be times and there will be uh, 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 instances where fasting and praying is the right thing. There's obvious time where, uh, where teaching and proclaiming and, and uh, getting out there and doing all those things for the Lord, that, that, that the service of God is absolutely necessary. There is obviously uh, times where I'm to read, I'm to pray, I'm to, uh, to be given to, uh, to the different sacraments of the Lord. Those, those things are still necessary. Are, are, are still important. But good grief. When any of those things trump the, the person of Jesus Christ, we have a major problem. Because Jesus is better than them all. Jesus has made himself available. And Jesus promises he'll never leave us or forsake us.